Happy Thanksgiving weekend. Listen, there is joy in the house of the Lord, and so we're going to sing of it today. Let's sing. Here we go. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. Yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out. forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Come on, declare. We were the beggars, now we're To the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. No, we shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. No, we shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out.
And we get to declare God's goodness because of the work that Jesus did on the cross. Amen? Amen. We get to declare his goodness because while we were still yet sinners, he saw fit to go to the cross to carry our sin, to give us freedom through his blood. That is the, why there is power in his name. See, Philippians 2 says that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. And it's because of the good work that has come through the name and the blood of Jesus. And so we're going to sing a new song this morning that just declares that, that there is power in his name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee, every knee bows, every tongue confesses, there is healing, there is freedom, there is peace, there is joy. Everything you need comes through the power in the name of Jesus. So let's continue to sing together of this power, sing together of his name. There's a name that levels mountains Carves out highways through the sea I've seen its power unravel battles Right in front of me There's a faith that stands defied 
sends Goliath to his knees. And I've seen his praise unraveled shackles right off my feet. Come on, if we believe that's the power, let's declare. Because that's the power of your name. Just a mansion makes a win. Giants fall and strongholds break it. There is healing. That's the power that I claim. It's the same that rolled the grip. There's no power like the mighty name of Jesus. Oh, no power like your name, Lord. The name above every other name. There's a hope that calls out courage in the furnace, son of faith. The kind of daring expectation that every prayer I make is on an empty grave. Cause that his name, believing that there is power. Because that's the power of your name. Just a mansion makes a way. Giants fall and strongholds break. There is healing. That's the power that I claim. It's the same that rolled the grave. There's no power like the mighty. Come on, one more time. There's no power. Oh, there's no power like the mighty name of Jesus. There's no power like the mighty name of Jesus. Let's pray together. God, we believe that. We believe that there is power in the name of Jesus. We believe that through the work that was done that has already been finished, you know, we get to call upon that name. We get to call upon the name of Jesus and demons flee and healing comes. God, help us to know that the power comes from you. 
that it's not because we say the name, but it's because of what you've already done. Help us to remember that in, in difficult seasons. Help us to remember that in joyous seasons, that every good and perfect thing comes from you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for allowing us to come before you and to give you the worship that you're worthy of. Not just the worship of our song, but the worship of our whole lives, God. We love you. We're grateful for you. And it's in Jesus' mighty name that we pray all these things. Amen. Amen. You can go ahead and be seated. Good morning, Parkview. My name is Nikki. I am one of the pastors here. Um, I love when Jeremy gets to come and lead us in worship. Yes, I know. It is, it is a gift and a blessing for us. Happy couple days after Gobble Gobble Day. I wanted to let you guys know and thank you for all that you did to make the 39th annual, right, if you ever hear, 39th annual free Thanksgiving dinner to our community. I have not been, you can clap for yourselves for sure, I have not been a part of that uh, before, and I know how to make dinner for like, I don't know, maybe 15 people. I could probably do 20, 800 or so, I've never done that before, so I had no idea what went into it. And we served um, probably a little over 300 people here on Thursday. We didn't start the dinner until noon. It was an open house from noon to 2. And we had people here at 11 o'clock. And by the time the doors opened, I think we probably had 150 to 200 people waiting to come in. It can't happen. We can't feed that many people. We had uh, 360 people that received meals outside uh, Parkview that our people delivered to other organizations. And again, that's not possible without you. Uh, there were over 100 volunteers who were either here on Thanksgiving Day or you donated money, you bought us a turkey, or you brought in stuffing and all kinds of different delicious things. And it was truly amazing. There was a gentleman who was weeping at a table, and one of our amazing, wonderful volunteers went over and just wanted to make sure that he was okay. And he said to her that he was more than okay. What he was weeping over was he was so thankful that he had a place to be on this day. And so I want you to give yourselves a round of applause. And I do, I want uh, us to give glory and thanks to God for truly doing more than we could have ever hoped or expected. This was the first year having the dinner back at Parkview since pre-COVID. Uh, and it was absolutely a blessing. I, oh, and Terry, we have to give a thank you for pausing on that picture. I had this one because Terry, you can absolutely clap for her, is a machine. I was going to say beast. I don't want to call her beast. She is a machine and she was wonderful and amazing and truly could not have done this without her either. I had the opportunity to serve in line. I got to do the mashed potatoes, which are like my love language. Mashed potatoes are my favorite thing in the whole wide world. Uh, potatoes, any kind of potato, mash them, fry them, put them in a stew. And as I was giving a lovely gentleman some potatoes, he said to me that this was the most delicious Thanksgiving dinner he has ever had. And not only that, but it was the, um, the atmosphere, the kindness of everybody there was uh, nothing like he'd ever experienced before. And so I asked him if he would share that with all of you. This is the best turkey dinner I ever had in my 84 years. Thank you. Thanks. Do you see all that deliciousness? And so, again, I just want to thank you for all that you did. Uh, whether you donated, whether you were praying for us, or you were serving that day, um, God really did do something amazing. And apparently Thanksgiving is over because it's snowing, and so Merry Christmas. It's Christmas time now. And with it being Christmas, there are two opportunities happening this week at Parkview that I would love to personally invite you to. The first of those is the Hanging of the Greens. Uh, Woohoo! This Wednesday from 6.30 to 8.30, uh, if you've not been a part of the Hanging of the Greens before, it really has become like a treasured event here at Parkview. We will all eat together. It is meant for everybody who calls Parkview home to come to. We will eat together. Rumor has it that Dana De La Cruz is cooking. Mm -hmm. I think the registration just jumped to like 250 or something. Um, and so we will enjoy a meal together. We will come into the auditorium. We will sing some Christmas carols. We'll have a moment to prepare our hearts for Christmas. And then we will go out and prepare the church for Christmas. We'll decorate together and um, have some yummies and goodies. But all we ask, this is a free event, is that you register so that we know how much food to have. And we hope to see you there. 
And lastly, but not least, my very favorite, well, one of my very favorite events of the year is the Women's Christmas Tea. It is, woohoo! thank you, Laura Bach. Uh, it is happening this Saturday um, here at Parkview from 11 to 1. And so if you've been a part of Parkview a while, but you um, are a woman and have not had a chance to connect, I would love for you to come. You don't have to know anybody. We have a place for you. You can sit with us. We will be in the gym, and there will be de beautiful decorated tables. Um, women are hosting. And then we will come into the auditorium, and our speaker and our worship are going to be so powerful. And we always encourage you guys around this time of year, around Thanksgiving and Christmas, often people in your life, maybe a coworker or a friend, a sister, a brother, a neighbor, maybe they wouldn't come on just like a Sunday in July, but they'll come to a Christmas event. And so I encourage you to not be afraid to invite people and ask people to join you in these things. And without further ado, we are starting a new series today, and Andy Klinky is our teacher. Thanks, Nikki. Whenever people say further ado, it's like, what is the further ado? I want to hear the further ado. Uh, and by the way, Nikki, not everything can be your favorite, okay? Favorite, mashed potatoes are your favorite. The tea is your favorite. Hanging in the greens is your favorite. It can't all be your favorite because then nothing is your favorite. Uh, I tell that to my three-year-old, but he doesn't get it either. Um, not that you're like a three-year-old. I just mean like if everything is special, nothing is special. Okay. Uh, but no, those are all great things. I'm really excited uh, for the Christmas season. We start a new series today. It is uh, creatively titled Jesus. That's the whole title. That's the title. We had our uh, best creative minds on it, and uh, of which I was one of them. And we decided uh, this Christmas season, we just really wanted to talk about Jesus. And so we titled it, effectively titled it Jesus. But specifically, we're going to be talking about four, the four portraits of Jesus that we see uh, in the Gospels. When I say the Gospels, I mean Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And each Gospel writer has a little bit unique perspective on the Jesus that they write about. And so over the next four weeks, uh, we're going to look at each Gospel writer's unique portrait. Uh, and I also think that helps answer an important question, because I think a lot of times people think, well, why do we need four portraits, four biographies of Jesus? Like, how many do we really need? It's kind of like the Spider-Man movies. Like, how many Spider-Man movies do we really need? But there are a lot of them out there. Um, this might not be popular. I don't know where you stand on the whole Marvel situation. I don't, I can't do the superhero movies. I just have never been able to get into it. I get so stressed out watching them. <laughs> who's going to clean, who's going to clean all that up? Who is going, like, even if you save the earth, there's just trillions of dollars of destruction uh, that has happened. And I also, side note, you can't tell me that when, like, Superman flies through a building that no one got hurt in that and that, like, there were no casualties. I just, I can't get there. So I don't watch the superhero movies. But anyways, we have all these, so you might be thinking, well, how many Gospels do we actually need? Don't they all tell the same story? And if they don't all tell the same story, isn't that a bit of a problem, right? Shouldn't they tell the same story? Because we're talking about the person and the work of Jesus. So I think it's a fair question. So what we want to do over the next four weeks is help explain why four Gospels and what we see about Jesus through the unique lens of each Gospel writer. And it is kind of, not to be, it is kind of like Spider-Man, okay? So hang with me. It is kind of like Spider-Man. I had to text our resident uh, superhero nerd on staff, Josh Afram. Uh, he's on sabbatical. I had to break his sabbatical uh, for this question. I said, Josh, I'm really sorry. Uh, I have a work question for you. He's like, oh, man, what? what's up? I was like, how many Spider-Man movies are there? <laughs> he was like, what? <laughs> how is that a work question? I was like, don't worry about it. Just how many are there? He's like, well, there are dozens. I said, no, how many are like of, of the first story, like the origin story. I know there have been multiple that basically tell the same story. So he helped me understand there are recently, there are three different Spider-Mans out there. I think there are more, but just in the last like 15 years. There's the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man, there's the Tom Holland Spider-Man, and there's the Andrew Garfield Spider-Man. You can see them on the screen, okay? Uh, and he did, he did say, if you're going to use this example, and if you're going to say my name attached to it, he felt strongly that I rank them for you according to what he <laughs> prefers. So, and I actually wrote it down. I don't even use notes, but I want to make sure I got this right because he was very adamant. It goes, for him, it goes Toby Maguire, Holland, Garfield. Okay, I got that out of the way. I, I fulfilled my obligation to Josh. Okay, 
So here's the deal. All three of these origin story movies in each of these franchises, they all tell the same story, right? They tell the story of an awkward kid who gets bit by a spider, who gets superheroes, whose uncle uh, was killed by a bad guy, who then vows to use his superpowers to fight evil uh, with great power becomes great responsibility, and he has a crush on a girl named MJ. That is the story of Spider-Man, right? The origin story. But all of these movies, they have the same basic tenets, they have the same basic facts, but they all have a unique lens or a unique perspective that they're trying to tell as they go on this story. So each one has a little bit of a different artistic flair. In the case you're like, I don't do the superhero thing like you, Andy. Let me illustrate it another way, okay? I've been in three car accidents in my entire life, okay? First one, I wasn't in my car. I was at church doing youth group, and one of my students uh, backed into my car, okay? Bummer. Super awkward. Uh, kind of moment where you have to go to a youth pastor and say, I just put a hole in your bumper. Okay, that was the first accident. Second accident happened just a few weeks ago. There was this um, light pole in Parkview's parking lot that just, boom, swerved out right behind my minivan. It was crazy. <laughs> like, it moved. I saw the, the footage. It moved. And it hit my minivan, um, my precious minivan. Uh, six weeks it's been in the shop. That pole really did a lot of damage. So that was the second accident. Uh, third accident happened, I don't know, maybe five or six years ago on Geneva Road, uh, right by Wheaton North, so Geneva and Gary. And I was in the left lane, and there was a car in front of me that was also in the left lane that uh, was turning off to you know, those kind of dead-end streets, those residential streets off Geneva, uh, north of Geneva. And so uh, they were slowing down to stop, and so I slowed down to stop, and eventually I came to a stop as they were waiting to turn. And I'm sitting there, and in the, my rearview mirror, some of you have had this experience, I see this car, and it's not stopping. It's not slowing down. And I just think, oh, man, I'm, I'm going to get hit. And so I looked to my right to see if I can get into the other lane or something so the guy in front of me would get hit, I guess. Now that I think about it, that's not very kind. But anyways, I couldn't get over to the right either, and so I just was trapped, and I just thought, oh, man, I hope this person sees me and slows down. Um, and then what happened is I saw this person reach down uh, for a sandwich that they went to eat, and I thought, oh, I'm toast. And uh, it wasn't toast, but it was a sandwich. And they hit me. They hit me. And then what ended up happening is uh, I paid $12 for the police report, which I don't know why it cost me money to get the police report. I was in the accident. I should get that for free. That should be like a, 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 a you know, public service. But anyways, I paid the $12 to get the police report, and the police report said that I stopped suddenly. Okay, and this had insurance ramifications and whatever. But the police report said that I stopped suddenly because that was the report of the person that hit me. What happened? Well, the car in front of me stopped suddenly. Now, from my perspective, I did not stop suddenly. I saw the person turning. They had their turn signal on. I came to a stop. But from the person who hit me, from their perspective, they looked down, got their sandwich, looked up. All of a sudden, a car was stopped in front of them. A car stopped suddenly, right? Two stories, two perspectives on the same incident. Which one is true? Well, they're both true when you think about the, from the perspective of the author, from the perspective of, of what the author is trying to communicate about those events. Both are true. Or maybe a better word, maybe not true, because some of you are like, well, scientifically, uh, we could measure what a sudden stop is, and then we could pull the drone footage, because we're always being watched, so some, somewhere there's drone footage. We could pull the drone footage, and we could measure if you suddenly stopped or not. So scientifically, okay, so maybe true isn't the right word. But both are valid, both tell a part of the story. Both help describe the scene that unfolded at Geneva and Gary. Both tell a story of the author. Both have an agenda. So both are valid. Both are helpful. But the facts really didn't change. A Ford Escape got rear-ended on Geneva Road by Wheaton North. And so what we want to look at over the next four weeks is what do these gospel writers, what are their unique perspectives? What are their agendas as they tell the basic story, the basic biography of Jesus? And I know the word agenda it may have a bad connotation, but I don't mean agenda in a sinister sense. I mean an agenda in each of these gospel writers have a message, have a perspective that they're trying to share about who Jesus is and was and what he did on earth and what was unique about him and what their experience of Jesus was. And so the each... Each gospel writer has this agenda that they're trying to communicate. But all gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, especially Matthew, Mark, and Luke, these are called synoptic gospels, meaning they give a synopsis of the events of Jesus' life. But Matthew, Mark, Luke are synoptics, and John, who gives a little more of a theological retelling of Jesus' life, 
all four of them tell the basic same story. Jesus is God. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross. He came back to life. He loves us, and he calls us to a radically different way of living. That is true of all four Gospels. But each Gospel, then, has a bit of a nuance on that story, a bit of an agenda. And so one more quick disclaimer. It's not to say that the other Gospels don't include part of the story of the other Gospels. So for instance, Matthew's perspective is that that Jesus was uniquely Jewish. And Matthew writes from a Jewish perspective, and his agenda, his, his goal is to help the audience, the readers, understand that Jesus was indeed Jewish and that he was the Messiah. That's not to say that the other three Gospels don't include evidence of Jesus being Jewish. It's just to say that Matthew uniquely highlights Jesus' Jewishness, okay? So what we're going to look at today is Matthew's portrait, Matthew's retelling of who Jesus is. And in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus is Jewish, okay? And we see this right from the beginning of His gospel. The way that he opens his gospel shows that Jesus is Jewish. This is this is the the first the first section of Matthew's gospel. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Then twelve or so verses of genealogy till we get to Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. And Mary was the mother of Jesus, who was called the Messiah. Thus, there were 14 generations in all, from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. So Matthew starts his telling of who Jesus is by making sure his readers know that he is indeed part of this royal line, this lineage that you can trace all the way back to the father of their nation, to the father of the Jews, Abraham. And goes through David, which is important because David is this kind of royal, majestic, heroic figure in uh, in Israel's history. And so he makes sure to include that David was part of the line all the way through to his parents, Mary and Joseph. And this is going to be important because Jesus, in Matthew's gospel, is going to confront the system of Judaism. That what Judaism has become. In Matthew's gospel, Jesus is going to spend a lot of time arguing with the religious elite, the Pharisees. He's going to spend a lot of time arguing with them about how they have interpreted the Hebrew scriptures, what we call the Old Testament. He's going to spend a lot of time arguing and correcting and saying, you have heard it said, but this is what I say. In fact, Matthew 23, it's an entire chapter where Jesus goes after how the Pharisees have twisted and manipulated the system of Judaism, the religion of Judaism, uh, to be in their favor. And this really only makes sense for Jesus to do if he's Jewish. And so Matthew has to establish that this is not some outsider coming in and telling the religious elite or telling the people or telling the nation that they maybe have gotten some things wrong. I mean, and we'll see a little bit later that Jesus is this master interpreter of the Hebrew scriptures, of the Torah. But unless he's Jewish, those, he's just an outsider coming in with unique ideas. But if he is uniquely Jewish, and not just Jewish, but Jewish of the most prestigious line of Abraham, all the way down through David and through the most royal lines, this, king, this kingly line, then there is some added authority that comes when Jesus teaches. And this is also why you'll see in Matthew's gospel this title, the son of David. The son of David is used nine times in Matthew's gospel. It's only used three times collectively in the others. Why? Because again, he is tying Jesus to one of the most famous kings, the most famous king in Israel's history. And so there's a, there's a scene in Matthew 12 where Jesus is doing a lot of miracles and he's doing a lot of teaching. And there's all these questions about who Jesus is. And this is the question. Of all the questions that people are asking, because you have to imagine, there's these swirls of questions. Who is Jesus? Of all the questions that people are asking, Matthew picks this question to include in his gospel. All the people were astonished and they said, well, could this be the son of David? Matthew specifically includes the, this, this rhetorical question. The answer is yes, according to Matthew. This rhetorical question of this Jesus is indeed the son of David, which makes him Jewish, and not just Jewish, but Jewish in the Davidic line, the kingly line. So he establishes that Jesus is Jewish, and then he goes a step further. He's not just Jewish, but he is a master teacher. 
He's a master teacher, master rabbi. In Matthew's gospel, you have this thing called the five discourses. These are five extended sections of Jesus' teaching. These are not just a little story here, a little parable here. There are entire chapters. And if, if any of you have the old school red letter Bibles, there is way more red in Matthew's gospel than the others. In fact, you know, the Sermon on the Mount is three chapters, Matthew 5 through 7. You have the Olivet Discourse, Matthew, Matthew 23 and 24, two full chapters of Jesus just giving these long sermons, right? Ray K style, long sermons. Just kidding. I love Ray K sermons. But there are 32 minutes always on the dot. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. He is very calculated. Uh, But in Matthew's gospel, Jesus is a master teacher. He has something to say in Matthew's gospel. He is a teacher and he is a rabbi. That's important. He's not just a teacher. He's not just a prophet. He's a rabbi. And so not only does Jesus teach, the posture that Matthew talks about Jesus' teaching is important. Matthew describes Jesus as sitting down. This is, this is typical of a first century rabbi. A, rabbi. a rabbi sits down in the synagogue. That's the teaching position. I stand. Ray sits. But I stand. A rabbi would sit at the head of the synagogue, and then the disciples would come, and they would file in around the rabbi, and they would learn from him. And so at the start of the Sermon on the Mount, for instance, the, the, probably the most famous sermon of Jesus, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside. And what did he do? He sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, right? So any Jew reading this goes, oh, that's what, rab- that's what rabbis do. That's what teachers do. That's what people that have authority do. That's what people that have schools of disciples around them do. This, this means something to the, to the first century audience. Matthew 13, this is another one of the five discourses. That same day, Jesus went out of the house, and he sat by the lake. There were such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat, and what did he do? He sat in it while all the people stood at the shore. So you have Jesus being set up in Matthew's gospel as a master teacher, as a rabbi, as someone that has authority. And so when he challenges kind of the interpretations of Torah, he he has some authority. Matthew is saying, listen to him. Look, he's a rabbi. He's a teacher. He knows what he's talking about. He's Jewish, and he's not just Jewish. He's a Jewish teacher. And all of this culminates in kind of what is the thesis of Matthew's portrait. All of this culminates and Matthew trying to communicate to his audience that Jesus was the Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. He was the one that the nation had been waiting for. He was the promised one. Now, we say Messiah a lot, especially around Christmas, but we don't always define it. So literally, the Messiah means the anointed one. Okay, It just means the anointed one. That's the, the, the literal translation from the Greek. But Beyond just the literal translation, there was, you know, the theological implications was the anointed one, the anointed one to do what? The anointed one to be Israel's savior, Israel's deliverer. And so when you have Jesus as the Messiah, he's the anointed one, the one that they had been waiting for to deliver, to, to save. And so when you hear the word Messiah, it carries with it all of these ramifications of the one that scripture has been pointing towards for generations and generations that would come to save or to deliver the nation. In fact, we already heard it twice. Did you hear it? In the genealogy, it said this is the story of Jesus, the Messiah. And then it finishes the genealogy and says that's how we got Jesus, the Messiah. All throughout Matthew's gospel, he's going to refer to Jesus as the Messiah, the anointed one who has come to deliver and to save Israel. That's also why throughout Matthew's gospel, you're going to read this statement all over. This was to fulfill. This was to fulfill. Fulfill what? The Hebrew scriptures, what we call the Old Testament. So as Jesus does his ministry, as he teaches, as he heals, and he, as he fulfills his task as Messiah, Matthew makes certain that those reading this account understand that these aren't just random acts or random sermons that he's giving. He will say, this is what happened, and that ties back to the Hebrew scriptures. This, he did this to fulfill, to show you that he is the one that all of Scripture has been pointing towards. He is the one that you have been waiting for. So again, let's stay in the birth narrative because it's snowing outside. It's Christmas, okay? So the birth narrative, all of this took place, what? To fulfill what the Lord had said to the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. 
So he, Matthew gives the details, and in case you miss it, in case you're, just, you're, you're not a good Jew, you don't know your Old Testament, you don't know the prophets, you don't know Isaiah, he reminds them, this is what the prophet said, and so this was to fulfill what Scripture has been telling you is going to happen. Matthew is making sure that a first century reader understands that Jesus wasn't just Jewish, and he wasn't just a rabbi, he was the anointed one. He was the one that came to save and deliver. Now, why is that a big deal? Because 2,000 years later, we think, well, yeah, of course, we have Christmas. We, we know all of this. We sing the songs. We have, like, this, this might not be shocking to us sitting in this auditorium. But to the first century, this was indeed shocking. This was, this is what they had been waiting for. For generations and generations, there had been many that had come before Jesus that had claimed that they were the Messiah that weren't. And so Matthew wants to make sure you are not still waiting. You do not have to keep waiting and don't miss it. Jesus is the one you had been waiting for. But see, Jesus did not meet a lot of people's messianic expectations. There was a certain set of expectations that people were looking for out of their Messiah, and Jesus wasn't it. Which is why Matthew goes through such great lengths to prove, to, to, to not just suggest, but to confirm that Jesus is indeed the one they've been waiting for. Because they were waiting for someone to, to, to be a physical, literal, political savior of their nation. They were, they were waiting for uh, deliverance from oppression, deliverance from Roman rule. They were waiting for security and prosperity and comfort. They were waiting for deliverance from their enemies Right? They had all of these expectations of what the Messiah would do when he, when he came, and Jesus wasn't doing any of it. In fact, there's the, the, the most famous kind of questioning of this happens with John the Baptist. John the Baptist, we talked about this in a series on doubt. But John the Baptist is this, is this figure whose entire life, whose entire ministry was to tell people that Jesus was the Messiah before Jesus really came on the scene. So he goes in front of Jesus, and he, he prepares people. Hey, there's a guy coming. His name is Jesus, and he's going, he is the Messiah. So when he comes and starts preaching and starts healing, like, listen to him. He's, he's literally kind of just getting the ground ready for Jesus' public ministry. So John the Baptist is, is in a front row seat to understand kind of who Jesus is and his, you know, kind of Messiahship. Well, as John goes about his ministry, he is in prison because the king uh, doesn't like him. And there's some persecution happening. So John is sitting in prison. And he's wondering if Jesus really is the Messiah. And this is fascinating because John has been the one telling everyone that Jesus is the Messiah. And so this is what happens. This is Matthew 11. John, who was in prison, he heard about the deeds of the Messiah. There's our title again from Matthew. So John sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? And what I love about this passage is it says that John the Baptist heard of the deeds that the Messiah was doing. And those are the deeds that caused him to question. See, this would be a different point in a different sermon if he was sitting in prison. He said, I haven't heard anything in a while. Is, is Jesus out there doing the, the things that the Messiah does? But what makes it so fascinating is he knows what Jesus is doing. He's healing people and he's hanging out with the poor and the sick and the outsiders. He knows the deeds of the Messiah, the text says. But they don't align with what he thought the Messiah was supposed to be. And so he sends his disciples to say, hey, can you just confirm this is the guy we're waiting for? Because this is not what I thought. I expected a revolution. I expected an overthrow. I expected freedom from oppression. And this guy's just hanging out with sick people and poor people and outsiders. And so you have this confusion. Is Jesus the Messiah or not? And so Matthew writes his gospel with this agenda so that those reading it, especially those that are Jewish reading it, will know beyond the shadow of a doubt that this is the man. Jesus is the man that they had been waiting for. He is the anointed one. He is the Savior. Because he comes and he is talking about a kingdom. But he's not talking about the kingdom of Israel. He's talking about the kingdom of God. And he is talking about comfort, but he's talking about comfort and security in terms of being content, not being free from oppression. 
And he, Jesus comes and he is talking about peace, but he's not talking about peace from Roman rule. He's talking about having peace with your enemies and loving your enemies. And so Jesus talks about all the things that they thought the Messiah was going to talk about, but he talks about them in very different terms. And so he challenges their messianic expectations. And so as I, as I was thinking about this portrait, this is, so this is, that's Matthew's portrait, a Jewish rabbi anointed one. That's his agenda as he writes his gospel. So I thought, okay, so what does that mean for me? 2023, I'm not a first century Jew. I don't have messianic expectations. And so what am I supposed to do with this portrait? And there were just two questions that, that I thought about that, that challenged me as I, as I thought about this. While I might not have messianic expectations, I do have expectations of what I wish Jesus would do for me. Ways that I expect and hope and think Jesus should show up in my life. And so like a first century Jew, what do I do when those expectations aren't met? You know, what do I do when the way that I think, the way that I think Jesus should show up in my life doesn't happen? What do I do when I'm disappointed with who Jesus is or isn't or does or doesn't do? What do I do with that disappointment? You know, um, I love, I do love being a pastor. You all are very lovely. It's very fun to be your pastor and one of your pastors. I love learning with you and I love growing with you. But there is a challenge every once in a while. And this is the challenge that I face sometimes. As every once in a while, I sit with people that are disappointed with who God is and what he has done or not done in their life. And I, in those moments, I'm not the most empathetic person uh, in the world. I don't know if you know that about me or not. Um, okay, some of you smiling and nodding. I didn't, you didn't need to do that. Uh, I'm not the most empathetic person. But in those moments, I have, to, I have to balance between being empathetic and being prophetic. By being prophetic, I don't mean future telling or being, you know, speaking for God. I just mean telling truth and specifically telling God's truth. So, so being a, a prophetic and being empathetic. And so when I sit with people that say, but God didn't show up in this way, where was God when? The healing didn't come. The marriage wasn't repaired. The kids never came. Still on the hunt for a job. Still struggling with chronic pain. They say, where's, where's Jesus? I, I thought this guy, we sing these songs about not being disappointed. We sing these songs about healing and, and, and seas being opened and highways through seas. And like, where is it? I don't understand. You, you, you say all the time that Jesus loves me and that he cares about me and that he's for me. And that if, you know, if you're the only person on the world, Jesus would still die for you. He loves you that much. and He knows you by name and he's, he cares intimately and deeply about your life. And yet here I am and I'm struggling. So, so what, where's God? What happened? Does he not care? Is he not real? Is he real but not very nice? And so I sit with people in those moments. And so the empathy part of me starts to try and fire. It, 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 I have to intention. I have to, the empathy part is I'm sorry. That must be really difficult. I can't, I can't understand what you're feeling, but I'm here for you. Can I pray with you? Is there any way that I can help? I know that's disappointing. These are true. These are genuine emotions, genuine thoughts that I have in those moments. That's the empathy side of being a pastor. The prophetic side then, I have to somehow then pastorally and kindly remind people of a truth, which is that you are not the center of God's universe. Hopefully you say that a little nicer in the moment. You find a way to say, whether or not God shows up in the way that you specifically wanted him to show up doesn't change who God is. It doesn't change his goodness or his faithfulness or his kindness or his character. Just because you wanted him to and are disappointed does not change. God is God and I am a human. And God doesn't answer to, to me. I answer to God. And so... There's this tension between, I'm sorry, but we still have to trust God that he is wise and good and kind and faithful. But what do you do? 
when God doesn't meet your expectations? What do you do? The second question I had from this text is just, am I willing to give my portrait of Jesus a fresh look? A fresh look. You know, the, the, the portrait of the Messiah that the nation had was completely different than, than, the, than the Jewish rabbi that showed up in the first century. And so in real time, the nation had to adjust their expectations of who God is and what his character is and how he was going to show up in the world. Now, all of us in this room have a picture of, of who God is and who Jesus is. And for a lot of us, myself included, that, that picture has largely been handed to me, handed to me by my tradition, by my church history, by pastors. And so I have this picture of who I think Jesus is. But the question is, am I willing to go to the text and allow the text to inform who Jesus is? Am I willing to go to the text and allow, allow the words of the text to say, well, but this is what Jesus is like. This is what Jesus tells us to do and to not do. This is the types of things that Jesus is concerned about. Am I, do I allow the text to actually inform my portrait of Jesus? Do I allow the text to inform what I think about Jesus? That's my theology. And do I allow the text to inform what I think about culture and society and money and sex and politics and like all the things that you're not supposed to talk about at Thanksgiving meal, right? Do I allow those words to actually impact what I think about those, those things and impact how I act in those categories? Do I take these words seriously or not? Or am I so com um, committed to just what I, what I think and have always been told Jesus is like? Or am I willing to evaluate it based on the text? You know, say what you will about the kind of the deconstructing movement. The deconstructing movement, you know, is this, this, this group, this wave of, of a younger generation that isn't happy with the portrait of church and religion and scripture and Jesus that they've been handed. And so there are some really uh, concerning things maybe about this movement, but one of, the, one of the most refreshing things is a genuine, honest curiosity around what does this book actually say? And then allow, and then taking those words seriously and saying, well, if this is what the book says, this is what Jesus says, then this has to impact and change what I think and what I do. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to allow the text to challenge what you think about Jesus? You know, sometimes I think, like a first century Jewish person, that I think Jesus has come to make me a superpower, right, to deliver me from my enemies. I don't have a lot of enemies, but, you know, deliver me from my enemies to make me comfortable and safe and secure and wealthy and happy. And I mean, that's what, that's what the nation of Israel thought the Messiah was coming to do, to give them the good life, to deliver them, to make them all of those things, happy, secure, safe, comfortable, deliverance. I have to continually go back to the text and say, no, what, what did Jesus come to, to what, what did he come to save me from? What is the life that he has called me to? What does it look like to be a part of the kingdom of God? Do you allow your portrait of Jesus to be challenged? Not by me or a podcast or a book, but from the text. Or from the text. Let's pray. Father, we love you, and we're grateful for these, these accounts, these biographies of Jesus that challenge us, that show us your character and your nature. We're grateful that you came to earth. You humbled yourself to be one of us so that we could know you more, know you more deeply and more intimately. And I pray as a result of reading these accounts of you, we would do just that, that we would know you more and more every day. We pray this in your name. Amen.
virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Will you stand and sing this with us? Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. It tells the, the whole story, and specifically what I love about that song is you and I are in that song, right? We are part of the story. So when the song talks about the church of Christ being born, that's you and I. It's everyone in this room and watching it online. And so I hope that you understand that you are, you are a part of this story that starts with Abraham and Isaac and this genealogy that starts. We are the offspring of that. We are part of this story of redemption that God is creating. So uh, hopefully that you are encouraged by that uh, this morning. Next week, we talk about Mark's portrait uh, of Jesus. Uh, so we invite you back. We hope that we'll see you on Wednesday for Hog, uh, which is Hanging in the Greens. Uh, if you're not familiar, uh, it's more of an internal name, I suppose, but because uh, it's not a great marketing name. But hopefully we'll see you on Wednesday for Hanging in the Greens, and hopefully we'll see you Saturday for the Christmas tea. Jim LaFendo liked that one. I appreciate that. Uh, all right, let me pray for us, and then we will see you back uh, Wednesday and then on Sunday. Father, we love you, and we're grateful uh, to be in your presence, not just here, but all throughout the week. And we know that your spirit never leaves us and that you are always with us. And so I pray that we would have this sense, uh, this incredible sense of your presence as we get ready for um, the holiday season. We pray this all in your name.